Welcome back, y'all, to another episode of the What in the Sam Hill podcast. I am your host and resident nerd, Aaron. Join me for this journey into the secrets of the universe. First off, I want to thank y'all for your patience with me in getting this episode out. It was a rough week-ish in our household. Um, The kid got sick and then she got my husband and I sick. But, you know, better late than never. This week, we are investigating the Boggy Creek Monster of Falk, Arkansas. Many people, particularly locals, call this creature the Falk Monster. It is a cryptid that has been described very similarly to Sasquatch and the Florida Skunk Ape. And there is some debate in the cryptozoology community as to whether all wild men type cryptids, such as the Sasquatch, the Chinese Yeren, the Australian Yowie, the Nepalese Yeti, are all the same creature or are different hominid species. Let's assume for the purposes of this episode that they are separate but related. Before we get into the research, I want to address my inherent bias coming into this. I already, full stop, believe in Sasquatch. Um, If you know me in real life, you know I'm extremely passionate in this belief. Growing up, Bigfoot was like my spirit animal because I am cursed, just like my brother and my dad and my grandmother before me with stupidly large feet. But then when I was in high school, I actually had a wild experience while deer hunting And it was so odd that I can really only presume that it was a Sasquatch growling at me. That experience led me to dive into the research. I found the work of Dr. Jeff Meldrum, and I've been 100% on board since. Fast forward to college, where instead of doing a report on my major, as I was supposed to do for business writing class, I did an analysis on the Gigantopithecus versus Neanderthal arguments for the evolutionary origins of Sasquatch and presented said report in a Sasquatch costume. So when you hear me talk about this monster, you know where I'm coming from. Now, there have been many sightings of Sasquatch-like creatures in the Falk area, both before and after the name Falk Monster was coined. But I don't want to risk lumping in actual Sasquatch sightings with Falk Monster sightings. I also want to avoid fake legends that cropped up after the fact. For example, we know journalist Martin Kirby admitted to making up a story about the monster, so we can presume that others did too, particularly those that may have been looking for their 15 minutes of fame. To avoid this, I'm going to use one specific incident as the gold standard. This was the defining incident, actually, the incident that put Falk, Arkansas on the map and clearly differentiated the Falk monster from wild men in general. The year is 1971. It's the end of April. On a Tuesday, Don Ford, his wife Patricia, Don's sister Elizabeth, and her husband Charles Taylor move into the old crank house on Highway 71 just north of Falk, Arkansas, which is a small town near Texarkana. Don's brother Bobby is also there, but it's difficult to tell if he was living there or just visiting. The early newspaper articles had several errors and inconsistencies, but the Legend of Boggy Creek movie did indicate that Bobby was just visiting. The next day, Elizabeth and Patricia hear someone stomping around on the porch. And then Friday, they again hear sounds like someone is hanging around the house and possibly trying to break in. They assumed, like anyone would, that the someone was human. Late Saturday night, though, just before midnight, the proverbial ish hits the proverbial fan. Elizabeth is sleeping in the front room when she sees movement at the front window curtain. There's a hand reaching in. She said, At first I thought it was a bear's paw, but it didn't look like that. It had heavy hair all over it and had had claws. I could see its eyes. They looked like coals of fire, real red. It didn't make any noise except you could hear it breathing. Bobby, Don, and Charles come a-running and spot the monster in the backyard. They shoot seven times but miss each time. At that point, they call Ernest Walraven, the local constable, who arrives around 12.30 a.m. Searching but seeing nothing, he leaves them with another shotgun and a stronger light. Soon after, they see the monster again. They shoot again, and the monster seemingly goes down. But when they go to investigate the body, there's nothing there. 
Instead, they hear the women scream back at the house, so Bobby takes off back to the house. Now, the steps up to the back porch were missing, so they had a ladder propped up against it, forming a sort of ladder ramp. Bobby is walking up the ladder ramp when the monster grabs his shoulder and throws him to the ground. Bobby could hear the heavy breathing and see the half-dollar-sized eyes, and he panics. He breaks away from the monster and runs around to the front of the house. In his terror, he doesn't realize that the door is closed, and he actually breaks through the glass in the door, at which point he passes out from the shock. Constable Walraven is called back to the property at around 1.20 a.m., so all of this occurs in about an hour and a half. Bobby is treated for his minor lacerations and shock, and once he comes to at the hospital in Texarkana, he describes a large animal, almost similar to a bear, but running too quickly and easily on two legs to actually be a bear, and everyone agreed that the monster moved extremely fast. In his investigation Sunday morning, Constable Walraven found strange tracks that appeared to have only three toes, and there were scratches on the front porch that appeared to be from three claws. Interestingly, Walraven's son lived about half a mile from where all of this took place, and Saturday night, his hunting dogs were going crazy, barking at something. He turned the dogs loose to chase down whatever it was. He heard howling like a woman wailing, and his dogs came back, refusing to chase down whatever was in those woods. The Fords moved out of the crank house on Sunday, after only five days in the home. Bobby Ford said he was done with Falk and was going home to Ashdown, which is a larger town on the other side of Texarkana. It appears that he did just that. I actually found a Bobby Lee Ford buried in Ashdown Cemetery that is the right age for our Bobby. The Ford story went 1971 viral. People went flocking to Falk in search of the monster destroying private and public property in the process. Other sightings followed, and it grew to a regional, if not truly national, craze, becoming the inspiration behind the 1972 docudrama film The Legend of Boggy Creek. If you haven't watched the movie, I highly recommend it. I actually watched it myself last night. And yes, it could be perceived as cheesy, but it actually holds up pretty well, and it influenced so much of our culture, both within cryptozoology and even within cinematography. Fun fact, nearly everyone who was in the film was either playing themselves in the movie or was a local to Falk. Even the filmmaker was a novice from Texarkana, but somehow they made movie magic and the movie was a massive commercial success in the theaters and drive-ins throughout the 1970s. Many have suggested that the Falk monster is a hoax, including Frank Shambaugh, an archaeologist at Southern Arkansas University. But the more I dig into the story, the more I find it credible. Certainly something traumatic happened because Bobby Ford went through glass to get away from the monster and had to be treated in the hospital as a result. And it was scary enough that the family moved not just out of the house, but out of the whole darn town. Not only that, the local law enforcement was involved in the situation, found the story credible, and was witness to the odd prints and scratch marks. Plus, the corroborating witness who experienced odd behavior from his dogs in response to odd animal behavior is the son of the local law enforcement, so a relatively reliable source. Generally, law enforcement officials don't like to come out as witnesses to cryptozoological events because they don't want to get laughed out of the building. So I don't think that this specific sighting is an orchestrated hoax, and I do think it is worth investigating further. The first key characteristic of the Ford's account is that the monster is quite hairy, and not like your favorite Italian uncle. It's hairy enough that Elizabeth mistakes the hand for a bear paw at first. This is probably going to eliminate any human interference. A 1971 monkey suit hand would probably look obviously fake, and even with hypertrichosis, also known as werewolf syndrome, it's unlikely the hands are affected at all, much less to the point where it is not obviously a human hand. But it also throws speculation at the monster being a hominid in general. Hands and feet are the least hairy bits of hominids, 
which makes sense. You're doing the most work with these body parts, so any hair that you probably had would be worn off anyway, similar to how many guys who wear shorts often get a line right about the bottom of the shorts where that leg hair really starts to thicken because the hair above that experiences a lot of friction from the fabric. So typically we would think of a hairy hand being more of a paw than a hand. The Fords also describe the monster as having glowing red eyes. That eye glow is most likely just eye shine, which is not the color of the iris like we might have blue or green or brown eyes, but rather it is the reflection of light on a special membrane behind the retina called the tapetum lucidum, or the tapestry of light. The cool thing about eye shine is that it varies between species, so a red eye shine will actually help us narrow down what exactly they saw. Eye shine generally is found in nocturnal animals, and there is a corresponding trade-off between the rods and cones so that animals with good night vision are colorblind, and animals such as the great apes or hominids that have good color vision have no tapetum lucidum and thus poor night vision. Humans, especially this particular human, can have red eyes in photos. Hello, every photo of me from the 90s. But that's really just a reflection of the red blood cells of the choroid layer behind the retina and is not true eye shine. Of the animals that do have eye shine, the color varies by species. For example, deer have white eye shine, so we know that Bobby Ford didn't get beat up by an ornery deranged buck. More importantly though, we can eliminate the big cats, particularly cougars, bobcats, and jaguars, which are either native to the area or have a significant number of sightings despite being outside the range area of scientific consensus. The big cats all have eye shine in the yellow to green range, so they can't be responsible for this sighting. There are several animals though that do have red eye shine, and a few that could be misidentified as around six feet tall. Now, I don't think a rabbit, a rodent, an alligator, a river otter, or even a fox or dog could be responsible for this sighting, but black bears and several species of birds, especially owls, have red eye shine, and that's critical both to this specific sighting and to the Bigfoot debate writ large. There are thousands of Bigfoot sightings that describe glowing red eyes at night. And this is a point of debate amongst those who would look to explain the animal of Bigfoot amongst what we know of the animal kingdom. Bigfoot, whether closer to Gigantopithecus or modern humans, is understood by all to be within the hominid family. And I think Dr. Jeff Meldrum's footprint analysis work has pretty firmly cemented that notion. The problem is that no member of the hominid family has a tapetum lucidum. All of us have superior color vision and limited night vision. Using the transitive property, one would then assume that Bigfoot also does not have a tapetum lucidum and therefore cannot produce eye shine. So we either have thousands of misidentifications or we have a relict hominid that breaks all the rules and redeveloped night vision and a tapetum lucidum. My money is on misidentifications caused by a fear and adrenaline altered mind but we obviously won't know for sure until we have a specimen. But maybe we could find another explanation for a red eye appearance in wild men. We as humans have long since solved much of the issues that poor vision presents with tools, technology, and adapted roles within a larger society. So many genetic disadvantages like poor vision have not been bred out of our population. Sasquatches and other wild men appear to operate in much more isolated family units and use strength and agility instead of tools to meet their base needs. Something like poor vision could presumably have been bred out of their population, but also they could have bred in helpful characteristics as well. We know that wild men are not strictly nocturnal, but they very often do operate at dusk or even at night. Redeveloping a tapetum lucidum seems extreme, but there are other characteristics that might benefit them at night without sacrificing their color vision. Bobby Ford described the Falk monster as having half dollar sized eyes. That's much larger than human eyes. I wonder if wild men species have developed a larger eye relative to their size than humans have. A large eye would presumably allow more light in and could therefore boost night vision. 
the various nocturnal species of primates, such as certain types of lemurs, all have very large eyes relative to their tiny bodies, so it's not something we haven't seen in the animal kingdom. I also found that in humans, high myopia, which is extreme nearsightedness, is linked with an attenuated or reduced choroid layer. If wildmen have developed strong distance sight for hunting reasons, for example, they may have a thicker choroid layer that may glow red more strongly than a human choroid layer. Perhaps with a larger eye and a thicker choroid layer, a wildman eye might mimic eye shine even without a tapetum lucidum, but again, that's all speculation without a type specimen. Another aspect of the Ford sighting is that the monster had claws, not nails. Biologically speaking, a claw has two layers, the unguis and the subunguis. Because of the angle of the keratin fibers, the unguis grows faster than the subunguis, creating that signature curved shape. The subunguis also wears away faster, which creates the sharp point. A nail doesn't have that two-layer action, so it looks, well, like the nails you see on your hand. There are some conditions that can change the appearance of nails, most notably would be onychographosis, also known as ram's horn nails, which can be caused by trauma or fungus, among other various reasons. Essentially, that damage causes the nail to thicken and even one side of the nail to grow faster than the other, creating a claw-like appearance. I was also thinking that there were some obscure genetic conditions that could create a claw-like nail, but I couldn't find any specific conditions that matched what was in my memory. I mostly found conditions that eliminated most, if not all, of the nail, which obviously would not appear like a claw. The fact that Elizabeth specifically described claws is as important as the red eye shine, because just like how hominids cannot produce eye shine, hominids also don't have claws. All primates have nails, though lemurs do have a specific grooming claw, so they are technically an exception, but one that is irrelevant to this case. I doubt that a hominid could have onychographosis on all of the nail beds such that it would look like claws on each finger. Plus, onychographosis is more prevalent on the feet than the hands, so while it is a possibility, it seems like a stretch. I'm not really sure that it's possible for a hominid species to really mimic claws in a way that would resemble a bear paw. In regards to the wailing woman sounds, that normally would make me think big cat, like a bobcat, but we already eliminated the big cats related to eye shine. So I wonder if the wailing sounded more like the famous Sierra sounds than a higher pitched bobcat noise. Without knowing what exactly was heard, it's hard to evaluate it. But I do find it interesting that whatever it was scared the dogs off both in this incident and other incidents noted in the Legend of Boggy Creek film. This reminds me very much of my own Bigfoot experience. I was sitting in an elevated blind, almost like a treehouse for you non-hunters out there. All of a sudden, there is a very loud moaning or groaning sound. My first thought when I heard it actually was that it was the screen door on our camper opening or closing because it had that very mechanical creaking characteristic. Of course, common sense quickly returned to my body and I realized that our camper was well out of earshot. I tried to look around and see what the sound was coming from. I actually stood up and leaned around the different bushes but the woods behind me were too thick to betray any animal hiding in there. I saw nothing, and when my dad and I looked around later for evidence of maybe a dying animal or really anything that could have produced that noise, we found nothing. But sitting here 15 years later, the two things that really strongly stand out to me were that it was so loud that a human would have to have been in the deer stand with me to have made that noise, and that the woods became pin drop quiet for the next few hours after. It took a very long time for you to hear a squirrel or a bird rustling at all. Clearly, it was a predator large enough to scare everything off. And my experience is very much in line with what people have experienced in the Falk area as well. So 
As much as I don't understand what they heard, I'm not surprised that the dogs ran off. The most defining characteristic of the Falk monster that differentiates it from all other wild men is the reports of three toed prints. We have reports of this with the Ford sighting, but we don't have any photographs or plaster casts to know exactly what they saw. We do, however, have photographs of plaster casts taken by Willie Smith. He found footprints on the edge of his soybean field in June of 1971, just a month after the Ford incident. I personally think these footprint casts are fake. I don't know if Willie was the one who did the hoaxing or if he is the one who got hoaxed. Being that he was an older gentleman, he probably was not deliberately responsible, but I don't think these footprints belong to a wild man. Firstly, they're not really that big. Supposedly, they're only a 14 double E. That may seem large to some of you small people, but it's not. I mentioned at the top of the show that my family has quite large feet. I, as a woman, am like a hair over six feet tall, and I wear a men's 11 and a half or 12. My brother is around six foot three, and he wears a 15, and my dad is 6'4", and depending on the brand, wears a 16 or 17 quad E. So two sizes longer and two sizes wider than the print. And my dad was 17 years old when these prints were found, so it's not a bygone era where all the people were smaller. 14 double E just isn't that remarkable. Also, if you've ever read Dr. Jeff Meldrum's work, you'll know that he has found that authentic Sasquatch prints have something known as midfoot flexibility. Essentially, Sasquatches have no arch to their foot. It's a characteristic typical of the non-human hominids, and it's something that differentiates Sasquatches from Neanderthals, who did have a firm arch. To my untrained eye, These prints really look like they have an arch, so I think we're looking at either a human print or just a flat-out fake. But I do still want to explore if a three-toed print is possible because of a specific story found in Lyle Blackburn's book Beast of Boggy Creek, which is an in-depth analysis of the phenomenon and it's a book I highly recommend. I wasn't able to finish it before this episode, but I am excited to hopefully finish it while I'm on vacation. Lyle describes being invited by Smokey Crabtree, a celebrity in the Falk legends, to look at a specimen that could have been a Boggy Creek monster. The remains were approximately eight feet tall, though the head was missing, so obviously the measurement was inexact. The skin was gone, but there was still other desiccated tissue decaying on the bones. The remains were found across the border in Texas. As it turns out, the remains had a bit of a reputation, but turned out to just be a Siberian tiger that had passed away from pneumonia and been sold to a taxidermist. The missing head, skin, and claws can all be explained from the taxidermy process. But the question remains if three toes is possible. All other hominids have five toes across the board, so that's what we would expect if the Falk monster is indeed a hominid. And there are actually some reports of five-toed prints in the Falk area, The problem is that these have not been found in conjunction with sightings, so it's just people connecting the dots and it's hard to say if they really came from the monster. But there is a condition in humans known as oligodactyly. You may have heard of polydactyly, where a person could have six fingers or six toes. Oligodactyly is the opposite, where a person has less than five fingers or toes. There are several underlying conditions that can cause oligodactyly as a symptom, but it also appears seemingly for no reason. It is, however, typically a genetic condition, which means you could have fewer than five digits on all four extremities, beyond what could be explained just by injury. So what do I think? Honestly, I don't think the Falk monster is a specific and separate phenomenon. Instead, I think Falk is just very squatchy territory. What I see when I look at the sightings is a lot of Sasquatch sightings and a few misidentifications. If there is a three-toed monster in the Falk area, it's likely just a Sasquatch population with a high rate of oligodactyly, similar to how the Doma tribe of Zimbabwe have a high rate of ectrodactyly, where the middle three toes are missing. 
I'm still not sure of what the Ford family saw, though. Clearly, they were in shock, and witness testimony is notoriously unreliable anyway, so I definitely think it's possible that this was just a misidentification clouded by fear. At the same time, though, you have more than one witness, so it's hard to discount it entirely. But also, it was dark. It's not like the creature ever came into the house where they could really get a good look at it. There was one newspaper report that indicated that the reporter felt it was a bear, and there's certainly many aspects of the story that reflect a bear. The hairy hands, the dark coloration, the claws, the red eyes, the reaching into a window probably looking for a picnic basket. All of that is consistent with a bear. Even when the creature supposedly went down but wasn't, might have been a bear going from two legs to four. It makes sense that if you have a bear with a damaged paw from a trap, that it would seek out an easy meal, that its paw might look misshapen enough to not seem like a bear paw, and even that it would favor bipedal travel. We have footage of a black bear in New Jersey running on its hind legs because it had injured its front paws. And quite frankly, I could see misidentifying it as a guy in a hairy suit if I saw it running at night, even though its gait was a little goofy and it would explain why the creature didn't cause any significant injury to Bobby when it pulled him off the ladder. If a healthy bear, or especially a healthy Bigfoot, wanted to hurt a man, it wouldn't be a problem. I mean, I'm a relatively large human at 6 foot 200 pounds, but if 6 foot 8, 400 pound Brian Shaw wanted to hurt me, I'd be treated for more than a few scrapes at my hospital visit. Not that I think he would, Brian Shaw seems like a teddy bear, my point is that I see a lot of reasons why the Ford sighting could have been a bear, particularly one who had sustained a paw injury at some point. What I don't have an explanation for is how the monster went down but ended up behind them. It was a plowed field behind the house, so it seems like they would have seen the monster slip past them in that clearing if it doubled back to the house like they said. It almost seems more like a bear shapeshifter from legend the way they describe it. Maybe like a calm berserker or something? But I suppose the darkness could explain why they didn't see the animal circle back, especially if it took a more circuitous route. I mean, try finding a black lab at night. So, in my opinion, yes, these people in Falk are seeing something, but it's probably just a run-of-the-mill Sasquatch. The Falk monster, as a three-toed hominid defined by the Ford sighting and documented with Willie's footprint casts, is not a real thing. That's going to wrap it up for this week's episode. Take a gander at the show notes to find links to resources used in the making of this episode, as well as all of the places you can find me. I will tell you in the show notes... There are links to a couple of videos that you can watch, a couple of clips, where you can actually see the Ford house and um, hear the testimony of Ernest Walraven. So I think that would be really cool if you're interested. Until next time, in the immortal words of Euripides, question everything, learn something, answer nothing. I will see you next week with a new episode. Stay tuned and have a lovely week. Mm-hmm.